All right, so the relationship between 504 and, and special education, um, I'm going to assume that you guys already have a footing there, so I'm going to go rather quickly on this. And then hope. Do I have it? Okay. Okay, there we go. So both have the same legal definitions, so to speak, for a free and appropriate public education. Uh, the, the only difference is the analysis on 504 is different than it's going to be for IDEA. Ken, up here, if you don't mind. If you don't mind just making sure that yeah, I'm exactly. in the, am I? You are. Okay, don't, don't touch it. All right. Thank you. Ken works with me. I'm not being mean or rude. Okay. I'll try. So just, just keep in mind that both of the, there's, there's a lot of similarities with regards to the FAPE de definition, least restrictive environment. Both of those are going to be similar in both special education and 504. The only difference is once again, the analysis of how those are defined and applied, okay? Now, under the IDEA, it applies to public schools, specialized instruction and related services is what's gonna differentiate it from the ADA and also 504. In fact, specialized instruction is going to be the big divider. Now, children that have an IEP under the IDEA up top also enjoy the benefits of ADA and 504. Now, children that are covered under ADA or 504 do not enjoy the additional protective benefits of IDEA. That is going to be, be the big distinction. Now, how the federal government has thoroughly, and now the state government has thoroughly thrown a bomb in there um, is with specific learning disability. That is where this is the new gray area and it is a huge, huge uh, problem that I have not mentally unraveled yet. Um, because we've seen a spike in in legal world, even though Congress passed something, you know, at the end of the Obama administration with regards to changes to, to or getting rid of No Child Left Behind and ESSA came, came into the picture. In legal world, it, it takes a few years for it to catch up um, in how this stuff is interpreted on a federal court level. And that only happens if there are legal challenges to the legislation and we have individualized cases or 504 cases going in front of the federal court. So we have not yet fully unraveled that. Just like, you know, we used to have the rally standard um, as defining what a free and appropriate public education uh, was. Well, that went away. And now we have the new standard of Andrew F. But the Andrew F standard, once again, it's going to take years for that to be developed in our federal court system and in our appellate court systems to really understand um, what a free and appropriate public education is. And then not only that is the reason we have Andrew F is because the rally standard, there was not a consistent application across all of the appellate courts. Um, and so they wanted to bring some consistency in. But once again, these require legal challenges. So when it comes to specific learning disability, because um, the word specific learning disability crosses into all three areas, they have different definitions, but the same. And that's where it gets confusing, especially for advocates and for parents. Because so many times, I have parents come to us and they say, but my child has dyslexia. My child has dysgraphia. My child has dyscalculia, which are specific learning disabilities. But at the same time, where are they at in that process? How is it being defined by the school? So it, it is a frequent, frequent situation to be at the same table as an eligibility committee, as an R RTI team, as a 504 team, as an IEP team, and have both sides speaking plain English, but not understanding what each other is saying or their perspectives, because each one 
comes with different definitions, different requirements. And then not only that is, when they, when they created these uh, policies um, or these regulations, some of these things are intentionally ambiguous. And when they're intentionally ambiguous, it also, it's a, it's a positive, it can be a positive, but then it also can be the biggest negative in the world, depending on the school district and how the school district decides it wants to apply that standard. All right, and so we're gonna get into that, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, out of all of the areas of law, or all of, the, all of these areas, come on in, you don't have to apologize. You missed all the good stuff. What's your name? Uh, Angela. Angela? Okay. And what do you do, Angela? Uh, I'm getting some sales. Are you? Are you an attorney? I am. Okay. So, Angela, do you have any, I mean, what, what's your connection other than morbid interest? Or do you have a child with a disability? Or? Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. So, um, I wanted to, to talk about that because you know, out of all of the 13 categories under IDEA, um, and then also because it's included um, in 504 coverage, this is going to be the biggest gray area um, that school systems for the next five years are going to be dealing with, um, especially because of the passage of the Alabama Literacy Act, uh, which I'm not a fan. Um, and I'm not going to be a fan. You can talk to me all day long about it. I'm not going to be a fan of it. Um, we shall see who's right, though, in a few years when everybody's screaming why 80% of our children are being mandatory retained. <laughs> um, okay. Americans with Disabilities Act or people with disabilities cannot be excluded from participation or denied the benefits of services, programs, activities of a public entity. Okay, no denial of access. Um, there's going to be crossover, obviously, in the definitions for 504, uh, but slightly different. Now, I had a case like this um, years ago that uh, was ADA 504, um, where they built a high school down in South Alabama, and gosh darn it, they just <laughs> didn't put the ramps in and... You know, and you sit there and you go, well, and then I had a similar case in Montgomery. They were different. One was new, one was not old. What well, one was not new. And so the definitions for oh, and then the other thing is the, the school down south was the only high school for that school district. The one that I had um, in the middle of the state had multiple high school options, uh, some of which uh, were fully accessible. So in situations like that, even the ADA, when it comes to public institutions, um, you track it back to when that building was constructed as to applying the rule for that. It just can't be exorbitant and it costs uh, put on a public entity to make changes if something reasonable uh, exists as an alternative. So in, in the middle of the state, they could easily send that child to a different school um, that was close by, provide the transportation uh, to where they didn't have to sit there and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to refit the old high school to meet the child's needs. Uh, as a parent, you may not like that, but that's, uh, that's what the policy was. Now down south, because it was a new high school, they had to uh, spend the money to bring it into compliance. So person with a disability, physical or mental impairment, which substantially limits one or more major life function and as a record of such an impairment as is regarded as having such an impairment. So this is the definition that we use to apply to 504 consideration. Okay. Now, a lot of people blame the Obama administration. Actually, this change came about at the end of the Bush administration. Um, and really expanded it out and added some really needed ambiguity uh, to, to really throw a wrench in what principles uh, and, and 504 directors have to consider. Um, okay, so what is a, a physical or mental impairment? This is not an exhaustive list, obviously. 
Uh, but these are some of the things that can be included. Now, what does it mean by temporary disability? Anybody want to throw that out there? What's a temporary disability? Okay. How about your star football player that uh, tears an ACL, has to, you know, be in a full whatever and, and or maybe be in a wheelchair for, you know, three months? That would be a temporary disability. You know, which means that, uh, you know, you'd have to create a plan or something to where he can or she can uh, be mobile and have access and equal access to whatever. Okay, so what is a major life function or major life activity? This is also not an exclusive list. You see at the bottom it says and more. Uh, but as a principal, as a administrator for a public school, do you see where there is a lot of coverage that could be taken into consideration and then at the same time, what this ends up triggering is a lot of unnecessary lawsuits, a lot of unnecessary claims over to DHR, a lot of unnecessary referrals over to truancy because we didn't do the back work to ensure that we are recognizing um, these disabilities under 504 and under ADA and under IDEA. Can't tell you how many stupid cases I, I get um, where the obsession in applying Alabama's Compulsory Education Act ends up costing the district a lot of money to correct, all because the assistant principal or the principal did not do the necessary back work to um, ensure that there wasn't more going on than the conjuring and fantasies that I see constantly where, you know, it's some massive conspiracy by parents to keep their kids at home. Do you know what I can tell you with certainty is that there is not a conspiracy to keep kids at home. Most parents want their kids out of their house for a six hour period. And, and especially, they're not going to go into financial loss to fool the school district by taking their kids to the doctor unnecessarily and paying co-pays and sitting in a doctor's office all day. So the parent is not considered an expert under this. The district is. The duty falls squarely on the shoulders of the public entity, not on the parents. So when screw-ups are made here, not the parent's fault. The parent doesn't understand all these rules and laws. You guys do. And I can tell you, if it wasn't for principals, I'd probably have to find something else to do. Um, I can tell you that most of my cases are, are because of, uh, and it's not just Alabama, um, Almost every state that, that I'm aware of does not mandate that the principals, assistant principals, are, are uh, knowledgeable in this area in 504, IDEA, or ADA. And I think it should be a yearly thing that they have to sit there and, and be competent in these areas. Uh, if a school system implemented a policy like that, um, then what you would see is you would see a decrease in the number of issues uh, because with knowledge comes the ability to, uh, to not trample. And so much of this stuff isn't done purposefully. Uh, it's just done out of sheer ignorance. Um, you are going to have your situation to where you just have some bad apples out there that have a power trip issue. Uh, and we're going to get into that in just a second. So mitigating, mitigating me, uh, measures cannot be a factor for not providing the child an IEP or a 504 plan. Now, what are mitigating factors? Medication is the big one. Now, I have, par I have some parents all the time, they're like, oh, James, my kid has a 504, but they won't recognize his ADHD for an IEP. And I'm like, you know, of course, we go through the questions and what we end up finding out is that the parent's been medicating the child since the child was five years old. And I said, has your school system ever seen your child not medicated? Well, no. 
but he's crazy when he gets home from school. He just goes crazy. And I said, but what about school? Well, he's on, under medication. He's on medication. I said, so when it comes to having the school system recognize your child's ADHD, and of course, what are one of the key components for eligibility under ADHD? Rating skills, right? Adaptive and behavior rating skills. Who fills those out? The teaching staff. So if the teaching staff has not seen your child in their natural state, then your child's not going to qualify for an IEP because they don't see the specialized need because you've been medicating. Now, it's all up to you to medicate, but I can tell you, as far as a parent, I can tell you a huge, huge red flag no-no is you can, it is, a, it is absolutely against the code um, in every possible way for a school system to mandate medication for a child as a condition for attending school. Wrong, 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 every which way you slice it. And I had a case a few years ago uh, in West Alabama to where they paid the parent to take her child, paid for the doctor to put the child on medication. If she did not put the child on medication, she could not go to school. Now, those are, those I call, I, well, most of the cases I have I consider stupid cases, but that was really a stupid case. Stupid case. So, if you're in a situation like this, the best way to, as a public entity and also as a parent, is to understand these, these mitigating factors. And if you're an administrator, I'd go through the extra step of explaining that to the parent. You may see this child at home, but we do not. It may be because of the medication. It may be beneficial, but at the same time, you cannot hold us to task for something that we do not see. And unfortunately, under the minimum requirements of the state of Alabama, we have to see those things. So we can't suspend reality under the minimal standards for IDEA for the school system to sit there and say, well, we'll take your word for it. The parent can be one of the raters, but you need two more for ADHD. So how are we going to get there under the minimal components of the state unless the child is seen for a period of time in their natural state? And I'm not by any means encouraging parents to take their kids off meds, but I have had parents choose, choose to do that um, for a few months in order for the staff to be able to have the mitigating uh, measures not be a factor in consideration. And they did it with, under the direction of their medical doctor uh, and monitored. Okay, so 504 components, child find, same as IDEA. You guys know what child find is? It's an impossible, impossible mandate for the public schools. It's a gotcha in the, in the public school. Uh, the nice thing is, is it's a gotcha, but there's no real consequence unless the, the child does, in fact, qualify for an IEP. And at that point, if the child does qualify for an IEP and you guys stubbed your toe uh, with regards to um, child find, then you would be um, liable for compensatory or remedial services uh, ba uh, dating back to when you suspected or should have known that the child was, had a qualifying disability and was in need of specialized instruction or required a 504 plan. So that's what you would be liable for, is, is, uh, is back services. Um, now, if you, if you really screwed up and you were referring the kid to DHR or, or uh, juvenile, um, you know, then, then you know, you're, you're knocking on the door depending on, on uh, uh, just uh, the level of ignorance or purposeful intent on harassment. Uh, we're going to get into to this area where nobody wants to talk about, uh, and it's a new area that I, I'm, you know, that we're looking at. Uh, that I, that's because we're seeing such a, a systemic problem, and that's uh, with retaliation. Um, and that's why an ounce of prevention and, and knowledge uh, will keep everybody out of trouble. 
Um, so same thing, there has to be an evaluative uh, component just like IDEA, accommodations just like IDEA for special education, and there is also a due process within 504. So the parents have a right, just like in IDEA, to utilize um, a, a, you know, the due process system. Now the due process system um, for 504 is slightly different being that the state pays for the hearing officers under IDEA, the local school system pays for the hearing officer and acquires them for 504. Under 504, does the parent have to stay in uh, the, the local due process system or can they jump straight to federal court? Yes, they can jump straight to federal court under 504. The only problem with that is if the local agency, if the public school has a defined 504 complaint process, then if I was a board attorney, the first thing I would do is ask it to be thrown right back down and make the parent exhaust the administrative process as defined by local policy. If the school doesn't have local policy, I would adopt it quick and I would make sure that I would slap it all over your information um, because that will allow your school or your board attorney to come in and immediately stop it and force the parents back down to the administrative level. And I can tell you, anybody who's been in federal court enough knows that, that I mean, all you have to do is have a hiccup and a federal judge will say, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, send it back down there. They, because our federal courts are clogged. And uh, so, I, and the reason I'm saying, I don't jump straight to federal court. I will use an exhaustive 504 process. Um, I will try to work with the school at every level down there. Unless it's, unless it's such a, a serious situation, there are exceptions. James, how separate is the 504 due process process from the IDEA? Are there separate hearing officers? Could you now, that they, they typically will use uh, the IDEA hearing officers um, because they, have, they already have a knowledge base. Um, and it's very similar with regards to the analysis, especially because IDEA uh, comes with accommodations. So it, it's a natural, it's just sort of a natural thing to utilize your IDEA hearing officers. You file a, complaint, a due process complaint for both, with both claims under the IDEA? You, you can, uh, and we've done that before. If the, I, if the 504 claims, uh, if the IDEA claims cannot be fully um, corrected through IDEA. So, ex for example, if we're going retaliation, if we're going monetary damage, uh, anything, those things aren't available under IDEA. So you'd have to go through 504 with your IDEA claim, exhaust the IDEA claim, uh, and then have the hearing officer put in the decision that, uh, that they don't have any power to award the other aspect and then that would open you up uh, and what it would do is it would defeat the district's um, defense uh, of exhaustion. You know you could in a sense go straight 504 but most board attorneys will try to bog you down and spend the district's money um, making you fight an IDEA claim knowing that there's no relief under it for let's say abuse or retaliation but still you'd have to exhaust their then use then then at the end of that then go into federal court uh, on the 504 claims where the federal court does have the power um, to hear the 504 aspects. Um, now you could have and I have had those situations to where a district um, will have a, a a 504 hearing officer separate from the IDEA one, um, you know, to try to also bog you down in a 504 hearing. Uh, before allowing you to jump into federal court. I mean, it's just, uh, in my viewpoint, that all that is is a chess game. Um, that's what it is. So, um, these are examples of the accommodations, and those are going to be in your sheets. Uh, and so there you go. Special education means specially designed instruction. All right, so that, in, that involves a content methodology, delivery and instruction. It's been adapted to meet the unique need, need, needs of the child. And then one of the most uh, important aspects of special education that people overlook, a lot of schools, 
is that it allows the student access to the general curriculum. Okay? And that's very important. The definition of special education, and then once again, I'm going to bring up uh, that conundrum that we have currently with SLD and what that means with regards to special education as it's defined in RTI. But see, I'm one of these uh, crazy people out there that actually believes that RTI is specialized instruction. And a lot of schools keep a child cycled in RTI, which I think is specialized instruction because they are modifying the, or they, they are uh, adapting the content methodology and delivery, even to the point where they have RTI classes. And a lot of the RTI classes are taught by resource teachers. How's that not specialized instruction? But yet, they deem it not because we have an RTI process. And it's like I said, under the changes and the definition changes under ESSA, it's only gotten more confusing, not less. That's why I got it. So it does include related services. And do you know why they call it related services? Anybody want to take a, a, a guess on that? I know it sounds simple. Anybody? No? Okay, all right. Because it's got to relate back to the educational performance areas. So there are five educational performance areas, three main ones that we cover, okay? The other two sort of depends on the severity and the nature of the child's disability. Um, or, and then the last one uh, depends entirely upon the age of the student in the IEP process. But the educational performance areas are critical because this is the reason why we develop goals and decide services. So if there's anything that you want to write down, this is going to be it. Three educational performance areas. Academics, which schools already know. They go, oh, well, academics, we do that. Okay. Communication is the second one. And you go, well, we have speech language pathologists. And then, you know, you have that myth that the State Department of Education likes to uh, parade around because we don't have enough SLPs out there that, you know, we're full immersion schools and full immersion language classrooms. And that's a bunk. That's not accurate. But, you know, you got to sit there and spin fictions in order to, you know, try to do your best with the resources that exist. The third one, often overlooked and often a source of due process complaints, and that is social emotional development, including behavior. Huge. Schools get into habits of academics and then communication is even in there. One of the biggest areas where we have constant due process issues is social emotional development, including behavior. That is specialized instruction. The fourth one, depending on the severity of the child's uh, uh, needs, you have functional skills. And then the fifth one is transition services that start when the child's 14 or ninth grade. So that's every child at some point, if they remain eligible by that age, are entitled to transition services. So those are your educational performance areas. So now that we have our educational performance areas, we look at related services. And related services would be any service that would relate back to benefit the child's special education, and the special education is their educational performance areas. So that's why we have psychological services in there, speech language pathology, physical therapy. Uh, we even have some school districts that recognize, as they should, equine therapy, uh, because it is beneficial to the child in areas of social emotional uh, development. Uh, you know, it, it could cross over into some other areas. The list is not exhaustive, guys. It is absolutely up to the IEP team. The, the law does provide a list, and in the Alabama Code, 
uh, I think it takes up three or four pages of examples of related services. But it is not limited by just what's on the list. So the IEP team has to take these same things into consideration that what would benefit the child in these areas to where they receive a FAPE. Now, one of the districts that I actually love a lot um, that I trusted with my own child when we lived in Alabama um, has a, a, a problem with this area of speech language as a related service. And what they do is they, they make the child, you have a qualified child under one of the other categories, not under speech language impairment, under one of the other categories. Because if it's speech language impairment, that's their special education, okay? If they are a speech language impairment. Under the other 12 categories recognized in Alabama, speech language would be considered a related service. And that would be the analysis that would be, ne that would be needed if the child had an IEP. But what this particular district does is they make the child run the gauntlet of the discrepancy standard and determining whether or not the child even qualifies for uh, speech language as a related service. And that is, a, that is an absolute wrong application of that analysis. You just don't do that. If, the, if your child has autism or if the child has OHI or, or, a, or an SLD, then the IEP team looks strictly at whether that deficit, um, whether the deficit in the area of communication, receptive language, pragmatic communication, uh, auditory processing, all of those things, whether they need to be remediated because they are tied to, let's say, academics, or they're tied to communication, or they're tied to social emotional development, including behavior. And you know what I can tell you about speech language services? And especially in our new world of dyslexia and specific learning disabilities, there is an absolute connection between language, communication, pragmatics, auditory processing, and a child's ability to read. Which then trickles over into math and their comprehension in math. Because a lot of our math is based in word problems, right? So that is a huge area where I'm telling you, um, when we do our analysis, it just absolutely baffles me. I have a case currently where the kid had speech language services and then all of a sudden went to middle school, up, uh, didn't meet the discrepancy standard, doesn't need it anymore. But yet, the receptive and, and expressive skills are in the toilet. There was a 22 gap in between the receptive and ex ex expressive uh, um, uh, skills. Not only that is, I haven't seen this type of dyslexia that is as far as that severe. The correlation between the two wasn't even looked at. You know, so at middle school, what ended up happening? Well, we're just going to stick her in an RTI class in a small group. The kid hasn't made any progress. And so what, well, it's not on, it's, has not made progress commiserate with her deficit. And therefore, in our viewpoint, it's a violation of FAPE. All right? And I'd have to say one of the big components of where the violation lies is the fact that the related services didn't go with her. And it was just dropped. Okay. It includes the civil rights protections of the other ones. Uh, important case was the rally, but we put that slide together before Andrew. Uh, Andrew F. is the new standard. Um, came out of Colorado. But like I said, it hasn't really been challenged in the courts yet. So we re don't really don't understand the gravity or, or how to even apply it uh, because it does need to work through that system. Okay? Okay. Uh, These are the 13 categories recognized in Alabama. And what I'm going to do is um, 
move on to the next one because, uh, let's see, I've got, okay. Recognizing harassment, interference uh, in special ed services, special needs students as perpetrators, and documenting responses. So we're gonna move over to that real quick. That's, that's my wife, all right? So if you see lovey-dovey pictures on my computer, uh, it's because I love my wife, all right? Uh, okay, guys, um, I have a different perspective on this. That's why I wanted to cover this topic. Um, you know, Rod and I, Rod is going to be the uh, presenter in the afternoon. He's a board attorney. It covers most of uh, in North Alabama. Uh, when MBI asked us to do this, we sort of selected topics. I wanted this one um, because I wanted to share a differing perspective in one that is not covered and one that is ignored, not only by state departments, but ignored by board attorneys. And guys, I am not one of these people that believe that bullying is a problem that comes from the home. Do not believe that. I see this, guys, I've been doing this a long time. So, and I'm very open to, you know, uh, flexible thinking but that's just not what i see where i see my bullying problems are in school systems that foster fester and encourage the behavior the places i don't see it have a different atmosphere a different attitude a different temperament the leaders of the school set the tone for how the students act you are going to have your rare occasion that you have your ignorant parents out there, uh, but half of the majority of those parents don't have the clue, first clue, what other students' names are. You know, and most of the time when we get involved and it's a bullying type of situation, the other parents are mortified that their kids were involved in a situation like that. So if the parents are mortified, then it's not coming from the home. So where is most of our bullying coming from? It's coming from our, the schools itself. And I'm not laying blame on all of them. But there's got to be a recognition out there that there are bad apples within the education field. What I don't like about you guys' this profession, those of you that are educators, is that uh, you don't run your bad apples out. You know, I... I, I uh, I pay dues to my, you know, Mickey Mouse Club. So does Ann. So does Ward, right? And Angela, right? You're an attorney? So you have to pay dues every year to the Mickey Mouse Club? Okay. Well, Deborah? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So the, the whole thing is, is that we... You know, we, and the, not only that is we have ethics and we have a committee that has no problem, especially on certain things. They love to trot you in front of their little disciplinary committee and ask you questions when it comes to client funds and, and communication with them. Why? Because it makes the whole look bad. And so we have a pretty good scare unit um, in Montgomery that keeps us in line. What I don't like about the education world is that you guys are... It's a fiction. They